time out of your Tuesday evening on this hot and humid Cape Girardeau day to come and uh, listen to our speaker. Uh, so I, I thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with a prayer and our pledge. And Mary Cassidy will lead us in a prayer, please. Go ahead and stand if you feel so moved. Oh, Father, we ask you to bless us. We ask you to help us to return to the time when we, America, look to you for guidance. Help us again return to those ways. Lord, forgive us when we stray. Lord, we ask you this evening to bless the words that are spoken. Give us the wisdom to carry out what you need us to do. And Father, just be with this country. Bless it and keep it for us in safety and freedom. Amen. 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 Yes, we'll start us off in the front. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, please be seated. All right, I think we'll be able to get started with the events tonight. And we're going to you're familiar with the Cape Public Library, but down around the corner of the restrooms here a little bit further down. Uh, we have some stuff back here at the back as far as the takeaway items. We have some books for sale, some flags, and 50-50 drawing that we have going on. And who's taking care of 50-50 drawing? Hands up. Okay, back here if anyone hasn't done that yet and is interested in it. Uh, she's collecting the money for that. And who is passing the teapot around? We have a little collection for the tea party to help us continue with the uh, efforts that we do. So we'll pass the teapot around. Anybody like to uh, contribute to that? And just briefly about the tea party itself. Uh, if anyone's new here, uh, I see a few new faces here. We formed in 2009 and then reformed again in 2011. And basically, uh, just to have some uh, weekly meetings where we try to develop events such as this and speakers to come in, as well as organize other things for uh, uh, in the political agenda and, and trying to deal with those issues. Uh, we have the monthly meetings, always going to be the third Tuesday of every month, so easy to remember, third Tuesday tea time. And then, aside from also what happens at the meetings, we strongly encourage uh, the attendance of things outside of these meetings, which is to say, nothing happens unless you get involved in government. And being involved in government is that you need to attend some of those meetings, whether it's city councils, uh, county uh, commission meetings, and all of these types of meetings. And in fact, I'll ask if anyone has attended a meeting this month and would like to Tell us a little something about one of those meetings they've been at. Anybody? <coughs> Boy, I can't believe this is the first, first one where I haven't had somebody step up or uh, uh, inform us of one of those All right. Uh, and we have the agenda, uh, or sorry, a list of meetings that he's passing out right now so that uh, in the future, if you want to attend one of those meetings, there's the list of everything that we have in our local community. Uh, in this county, so. Any other announcements anyone else would like to make? Enda, I know yeah. you had an announcement you um, make. This Friday, we're having a, uh, it's called a Fatherless Day Rally at uh, Jefferson City, the Capitol building, from noon to three. It is trying to uh, show support for family court reform. Uh, we'll have speakers there and a PowerPoint show, showing the changes that over 20 states are now trying to make. Uh, we want to stop the abuse of parents and children of divorce. Children need and want both parents after divorce. It's in their DNA. So anybody who might be interested in going to that rally, contact me after the meeting. I've got a flyer. Also, if I may go on. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> the, um, Last month, we had Keith Carmichael. He's the director for Convention of States Project in Missouri. He uh, is still needing um, volunteers for different districts and uh, just any kind of odd jobs to help that uh, project go forward. If you're interested in that, if you didn't come last, last month and you want to know more, contact me after tonight. Okay. Thank you. Another announcement? Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> I see a, a couple of new faces here, and I just want to make a quick mention of Center for Self-Governance and give you a flyer for it. 
Uh, Center for Self Governance is a uh, training system to take uh, individuals and, and, and teach them how to keep the republic. Uh, most of the people that are in the Tea Party here are taking those classes or have taken those classes, plan to take those classes. Uh, the new folks that I see here tonight, I urge you to look into these classes and training. Um, between the Tea Party meetings, this group gathers and keep the Republic meetings and goes on missions and, and exercises our civic authority to control and institute government. I said a lot of words there. Come to the classes and learn exactly what those mean. Okay? So I just want to pass those flyers out real quick. And you can contact Brian or myself. Um, and we will, if you, okay. if you have a couple of acquaintances and you would like to have a class, uh, contact us and uh, we'll arrange a class on a schedule and, and make it conducive for you. Uh, we were holding classes on a regular basis, uh, and we can still do that, but we would like to make it more available to you on your level and your place uh, and time, so we'll just get in touch with us. Right? But if you really want to make a difference to keep the Republic, you need to become involved, and this will teach you how. And I guess one last announcement, announcement or part of the business is after the meeting, we have a little after the meeting meeting, and generally at the people Brady's here in town. So anyone or everyone's invited to come out and join us. Uh, if anyone's obliged and want to come out and have a little something to eat or drink after the, after the meeting. Any other announcements from anyone else? All right, then we'll be right into it. Cool. Any newbies that want to be a part of our email list, we have a sign-up sheet that will be at the back of the room. Just be sure to put a phone number with your um, area code if it's kind of like a cell phone out of the area, and an email, and you can be on our contact list um, so that you know what's going on in the area. I'll leave this back here for you guys to sign up after the meeting. And you can like us on Facebook, and our website is kitkindeteaparty.org. Okay, we still have the 50-50 going on, and I have books for sale back here, and I have all kinds of free information, and I have the 50-50 uh, tickets, I think I said that already, and I'll be back here, and there's coffee and cookies up there if you're hungry, and welcome everyone. And now, I guess I'll introduce our speaker that we have here this evening, and it's Ryan Johnson. Uh, he's a founder and president of the Missouri Alliance of Freedom a conservative advocacy and accountability group focused on advancing a conservative policy plan in Missouri and holding elected officials accountable. The mission of the Missouri Alliance of Freedom is to protect and grow individual, religious, and economic liberty through Missouri, throughout Missouri. Ryan's goal is to boldly change the political and policy language in favor of a limited government. Uh, he's a graduate of the University of Central Missouri. Ryan is a veteran political professional and activist, and with over a decade of experience serving in leadership roles on numerous political campaigns and projects. He has worked with some of the top political consultants in the country, a member of Congress, and is a proven fundraiser and political strategist. Ryan travels uh, extensively throughout Missouri. He has trained conservative leaders across the state on effective grassroots advocacy and fundraising strategies. Uh, the Alliance for Freedom's first year, he spoke to over 100 organizations to promote conservatism and accountability with a focus on limited government. He has been quoted by numerous Missouri media outlets and is a weekly guest on the KSGF Mornings with Nick Reed in Springfield. And prior to entering the public uh, policy and political arena, he spent eight years serving on active duty in two branches of the United States military. He first served with the United States Army Combat uh, Engineer with the 1st Cavalry Division in Fort Hood, Texas and later served with the U.S. Coast Guard as a corpsman with the Presidential Honor Guard in Washington, D.C., where he maintained a White House security clearance. He and his wife, Becky, had been married for 15 years under proud parents of two young daughters. The Johnsons make their home in Cass County, Missouri, where Ryan is a small business owner and entrepreneur. Ryan is a current committeeman and, and the former chairman of the Cass County Republican Party. When he is not working, he is busy being a dad and being active in church. He is an avid reader, amateur historian, and student of political science. He is also a marathon finisher, having run a uh, Marine Corps marathon. It's a long time ago. Oh, okay, so yeah, uh, you didn't have to do that. Just, 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 just wearing the fence. Yeah, just, 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 just the fence. All right. That was the point, too, that was the kicker, you know. So, please come on up. Thank you. Thank you. as well as a, a brochure, if you'll pass that around. And then I also brought business cards. These 
these have my cell phone on it, as well as my email, the one that I actually get. So feel free to contact me anytime you want about any issue you want, and I'll do my best to, to shoot you straight, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our organization and things like that. I also like to keep in touch with people, just like your local tea party do, and I brought my own sign-up sheet. You're welcome to give me your email and your name if you want. You're also welcome not to. I won't be offended. I'm on every single email list myself and, and understand what it's like to be deluged by email updates. So, my name is Ryan Johnson, and like you said, I've worked uh, for numerous years, almost a decade, in the political policy space, mostly in, the, in Missouri, a little bit at the national level. Uh, I've done a congressional race in Georgia. And over a period of time, I don't know about you, but I kind of became disillusioned with the process. Sometimes I, I felt like I was working for the right person at the right place at the right time, and then other times I felt like I was just getting paid to do a job to help elect someone who is maybe marginally better than the Democrat who was running. And when they got into office, wasn't always exactly the most inspiring figure. And that's kind of the way I felt. And so after about a decade of that, a little bit less. I don't know about. I became. I became kind of disillusioned. Like I said, I became. I got sick of it. Quite frankly, I got fed up. And so after the 2012 election cycle, a friend of mine and I were sitting around his kitchen table uh, in, in the Northland, North of Kansas City, and we were sitting there talking about the 2012 election cycle. We were commiserating about the results. Not too happy. Yeah. And we were wondering what we could do, where we could do it, and where we could be more impactful, where we could make a difference. And so after a lot of brainstorming, a lot of time, and, and some prayer, we decided upon uh, an organization like this. Uh, it was a little bit of time before we decided what to name it. But the idea was accountability. Uh, accountability specifically at the state legislative level. So your state representatives, your state senators. Why we chose that space was because we thought we could make a real difference there. These are your neighbors. Uh, you know them. You run into them at the coffee shop, at the grocery store. You have their cell phone numbers. You can text them. They're accessible. The state is also the best entity to push back against the federal government and its vast overreach. And if you spend any time in Jefferson City, any time at all, you know that it has the same problems that Washington, D.C. does. Maybe to a lesser extent, but not that much. So we decided that we would engage there. Well, it takes you know, money to run an organization like this and to be able to do it to the scale that we wanted to do it and to do it on a full-time basis. So I do come from a long uh, history of, of fundraising, and so we were able to employ you know, a little bit of that experience. And it took a, it took a while. It took well over a year uh, of, of various concept papers, budgets, so on and so forth, before we were, we were able to, to stumble upon uh, potential funding, and then it took a while of, of relationship building, a conversation back and forth before uh, they were comfortable with with stroking um, a check to kind of help get us started. And so we are a 501c4 nonprofit company. We uh, rely on philanthropy, like any other um, like any other nonprofit company, to survive, uh, to pay the bills, to pay the rent, and to be able to do what we do in Jefferson City. So what is it that we do in Jefferson City? You know, there's a lot of groups. You have Americans for Prosperity Missouri. You have United for Missouri. Uh, these are more like statewide level groups. And then you have groups like the Cape County Tea Party and, and a lot of different groups in between that I've met with throughout the state over the last year plus now, almost a year and a half since we launched. And the nice thing about all those different groups is they're all pushing for relatively the same ideals. They all recognize the problem, and that's too much government. That's Republican legislators as well as Democratic legislators. Uh, Democratic legislators following through with their campaign promises, and Republican legislators not following through with their campaign promises. So what do we do? How do we get people who may or may not have your best intentions at heart to do what it is we want them to do. Especially the ones that run from this neck of the woods, or my neck of the woods in Cass County, Missouri, which is just south of Kansas City, in case everybody, anybody's ever, ever been there. It's a little bit of a drive. But typically, my state reps and my state senator, and I've got a couple of good ones, I'll admit, you know, when they run, 
they talk about <coughs> lowering taxes. They talk about less government. They talk about uh, life and guns, and they talk about shrinking government and government's too big. And has anybody ever heard these oh, yeah. these things? Yeah. Okay. But the problem is, is if you look at Missouri, since the Republicans first took the majority, 2002, 2003, that's about the time frame, uh, they retook the majority for the first time about 50 years. Democrats had control for, for that long. It was, a, it was a great and glorious time in Republican politics, and the budget then was about $18 billion, and nowadays it's about $26 billion. So you tell me, has it grown or has it shrunk since we've had our, our fingers on the, on the lever? It's grown. It's grown exponentially. So our goal was to really try to plug in and engage and help hold these uh, ladies and gentlemen accountable and to try to bring what happens in Jefferson City back here to Cape, to St. Louis, to Kansas City, to Springfield, to Joplin, and let people know what's going on in Jefferson City and what's not going on in Jefferson City. So in the current legislature, as it currently stands, we have 117 Republican state representatives a veto-proof majority, an unprecedented majority, and we have 25 Republican state senators. Now, I'm assuming in a Tea Party meeting that most of you identify as conservatives? Fair to say? Yeah. Okay. Do, do most of you vote Republican? Okay. Kind of begrudgingly, but, you know, it's, it's that or the other, right? Likewise. Unfortunately, though, we spent an inordinate amount of time these last two sessions now that we've been in existence, while they're in session, we're in Jefferson City. And if they're there at 7 a.m., we're there. If they're there at 2 a.m., we're there. Even if it's an issue that we're not necessarily following. There were over 2,000 bills proposed this last legislative, legislative session alone. Now, thankfully, only a couple hundred of those, a little less maybe, actually passed. And most of those never saw the light of day. But still, if you can imagine 200 plus new laws every single time these easy authors meet in Jefferson City for you and I to live under. Is government growing? Yes. So what did we do? What did we fought for? What did we fight against? What did we try to kill? There were several things, and it's kind of a juggling act, but I won't, and I won't bore you with all of them. But for instance, there's a program called the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. Missouri, maybe you've heard of it. Missouri is the, the only state yet to not have one. Uh, you have a state representative in this, this part of the world, uh, southeast Missouri, named Holly Rader, who fervently believes that this is the right thing to do to address prescription drug abuse. We took the opposite thing, <coughs> and I love Holly, we agree on just about everything, except for this issue. And we did our absolute best to try to kill the bill. We were respectful, we were nice, we, were, we tried to be honest and upfront with her with what we were doing, and the others who were promoting it. Uh, the senator who was pushing it is a guy named Senator Sater. He's from southeast Missouri, <coughs> southwest Missouri. Kind of noticing a trend here. These are the most conservative parts of the state. Mm -hmm. And yet we find ourselves fighting against <coughs> people who are representing the most conservative parts of the state. Now we were fortunate and we fought it very hard along with I'm sure some of your help and others. And it took a, a, took a whole team of people to do so but we were able to stay that for an additional session. It'll come back next year. We also found ourselves fighting a guy named Senator Doug Leiblow, senator from just south of here, again, part of the most conservative part of the state. What was he pushing? A gas tax increase. We had Republicans overwhelmingly <coughs> pushing a tax increase. Now, if you go to his campaign website, do you think it says it's for or against raising your taxes? Any ideas? Against. Against. against, very good. His campaign website says that he's against increasing taxes. And yet here he was, vigorously proposing and pushing for and trying to get across the finish line a tax increase to pay for roads. Now, we think that roads are a legitimate function of government. I'm very thankful to have them. But I also think that there's a better way to do it than raising your taxes and raising my taxes. So we fought against those kinds of things. We. Uh, the year before, we fought uh, for the Common Core bills and Common Core. Um, it's still in process and it's still a fight that's ongoing. It's really traditional conservatism with a strong libertarian streak. We spend a lot of time lobbying for and against things actually in the Capitol, and then when we're not in the Capitol, we're trying to 
trying to help teach other people, citizens like Brian does, how to lobby. Our class is not as extensive as his, and I highly recommend it if you haven't taken it to take uh, Center for Self Governance uh, class. Um, we have a, a like four hour little workshop that we do that's called a, a grassroots lobbying workshop, which is very specific to the Missouri State Legislature. Um, maybe kind of an, an addendum to, to, to Brian's class. Uh, so get involved would be my point to you. You already are. You're here on a weeknight at a tea party meeting. But reach out to your, your friends and your family and try to encourage them to get involved. It's been my experience, and I'll share another little boring legislature, legislative victory story with you. When they hear from you, they react. Now, you might not feel that way about your, your, your congressionals, your federal delegation, but at the state level, they react when they hear from you, especially when they hear from a nun. And if they hear from 10 of you or a dozen of you, or even more, hopefully, on a certain issue, they start to react and they start to respond. So if you get a, an email from us because you sign up for our list, do yourselves a favor, do your children and your grandchildren a favor and spend that five minutes on the phone that it takes calling their office and telling them, please don't vote for that tax increase. Not only don't vote for the tax increase, but if you're a state senator, stand up and filibuster that tax increase so it doesn't go anywhere. That's important. Now when I agreed to come down here, um, I said that I was going to talk about the importance of ideals and ideas and activism. And I want to do that for a moment. Now, is, is it anybody I've heard you said, all said that you were conservatives? Do you come from that background? Anybody that does not come from a, a conservative background from their family necessarily? Right here? Okay. Yeah, you're not alone. Me too. So I was raised by a, a, a family of Democrats. My, my mother, God bless her, voted for Barack Obama twice. My little brother makes Barack Obama look like a milk toast moderate in his politics. <laughs> I say a little, he's 6'6", so my younger brother. <laughs> and he is a, a, a committed leftist, and he knows that I'm wrong in just about every issue, and I know that he's wrong in just about every issue, and Thanksgiving is kind of interesting in our home. But I can remember when I was a kid, being raised the way I was, my dad left when I was about 10. So I didn't see him much anymore. And then my mother, single mom, went to work and worked a lot. And so my brother and I spent a whole lot of time alone. And I can remember uh, one time, this was in the 80s, I just turned 40 this year, uh, watching a, a miniseries, if you guys remember miniseries, uh, they were broadcast during the, the uh, Christmas and Easter season called Jesus of Nazareth. Anybody remember that? It was filmed in the 70s. It looks like it was filmed in the 70s. Uh, but it's still pretty good. I was sitting there in the living room alone at like 10 or 11 years old, so this would have been 85, 86, uh, watching, watching the show, uh, hearing these things for the first time in my life. I had been raised in a liberal home with no church. Uh, my dad had been raised as a Catholic uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, and my mom had been raised as a Lutheran in Florissant, Missouri, and on their honeymoon they moved to Kansas City, which is where I grew up. They chose not to raise their two boys with any religious tra training or teaching whatsoever, which leaves kind of a hole and, uh, and a lot of questions. So I, was, I just had, like I said, a, a ton of questions about everything from life, faith, life after death, you name it, I had to, I had to question. And we had a Bible in the house, but it was on the shelf, at the bottom of the shelf, on the right-hand side, collecting dust. We didn't pray in our home, we didn't pray over our food, we didn't do anything. And so I'm sitting here in front of this TV at Christmas time, I think it was, watching this show, Jesus of Nazareth, and I'm listening to this thing that I later found out was called the Sermon on the Mount. And then also, Jesus teaching in the temple. You know, words like, you know, come unto me and I will give you rest. Never heard it before. And I can remember hearing this, these words for the very first time in my life, and a tear started to stream down my face. And that set me on a journey towards, on my own, towards discovering Christ. Now, it took a while. I was about you know, 14, and still, even as a teenager, I was a knucklehead. But I began to learn a little bit more about who Jesus Christ was, who he is, and what he means to you and me. Now, I don't know if I'm talking to a religious crowd or not, but I'm just telling you my journey into conservatism, if you will, 
and I can't do that without telling you a little bit about my you know, religious um, background. So that really kind of led me on a journey. Now, when I graduated from high school, I joined the military. The one conservative influence in my life was my grandfather from Ferguson, Missouri. He's now deceased, and he was a retired major general, U.S. Army. He was a very conservative man, and he had a little bit of influence over me. And I remember talking about national defense and the Army and all these kinds of things and thinking it was the coolest thing ever every time I got to be around Granddad, which wasn't often enough. And when I went into the military, I kind of went into it wanting to make Granddad proud. And so I joined the United States Army. I was fifth generation Army, and I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas in the 1st Cavalry Division in 1993. I arrived at my new unit in January of 1993 and we had a brand new president. Anybody remember President Clinton? The, the military that I joined was Reagan's military that he had built and that H.W. had maintained. By the end of my three years in the United States Army as a combat engineer, which if anybody's familiar with that, it's essentially an infantryman with a little bit of knowledge of landmines, booby traps, explosive demolitions. In short, for three years I blew stuff up for a living. It was a lot of fun, but it didn't really transfer into the civilian sector that well. <laughs> Unless you look at what I'm doing today. <laughs> but I remember joining and come, going, hit, heading to the first cab which is a rapid deployment unit, by the way, meaning it has to deploy anywhere in the world within 72 hours to close with and kill the enemies of the United States. It's its job. By the end of my time, three short years of Clinton's presidency, we didn't have enough rounds, bullets, 5.56 five, millimeter rounds to go in your M16 rifle, to go to the range to qualify on your M16 rifle, which is kind of basic. You know, if you're part of a rapid deployment unit in a combat arms MOS, you want to be proficient on your M16 rifle. And that was the degradation of the military that I experienced, even in a very short amount of time under the initial years of the Clinton presidency. I got out of the Army, and I joined the Coast Guard thereafter, and that was a whole other experience that I won't go into tonight. But that really instructed, that those years were very formative in terms of instructing my my views as a conservative. Now, when I joined the Coast Guard, and I'm very thankful that I did, because as I showed up to my new, brand new unit in DC, the Coast Guard Honor Guard, as I was checking in on the quarter deck, which is a fancy maritime word for front desk, <laughs> I'm handing in my 201 file, and I hear a door open behind me, and so I turn around to look who's walking through the door, and it's another a young lady who was also in the, middle, in the Honor Guard and we've now been married for 16 years. <laughs> so the Lord had a purpose in sending me uh, to the Coast Guard, I feel. Now, Becky and I, when we were newly married, began to go to church. And for me, that was really kind of the first time I've actively been going to church. Now, I still kind of bought the liberal lie in terms of abortion politics, meaning I was individually opposed, but who was I to impose my beliefs on someone else? Until one day I was thinking and praying about it, and I had this, for me, personal epiphany. And it was like a, a light piercing through darkness. And that epiphany was this. We're talking about two people, two bodies. That you have an unborn and a woman. And the woman or anybody else had no more of a right to kill their unborn child than they did to kill their born child. I became, in about a split second, vehemently pro-life, because I felt like that unborn baby, a person, was entitled to all the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, property rights, denial. And that really helped me, um, really instructed me. And so as I kind of was converted not only to Christianity, but also converted to conservatism, if you will, I began to try to look for the conservative solution to every problem that we face as a country or as a society or as a state. Because there is a conservative solution. Whether it's tax policy, whether it's abortion politics, whether it's the size and the scope of government and how far they can reach into your lives and in your pocket. And the conservative answer or libertarian answer is less government more individual liberty in every facet thereof, and it's worth fighting for. And ideals and ideas matter. 
I came to conservatism not because the Republican Party was full of a bunch of stuffed shirts with suits and ties and really boring people. I'm being a little te teasing my, my friends here a little bit, but um, and I kind of often fit into that category if you've ever seen me or at an event. But I came into the Republican Party because I became a conservative. I came into the Republican Party because I saw it as the best vehicle to advance conservatism and libertarian principles. And I came into the Republican Party because the ideas were better, because the ideas were centered on freedom across the board. And ideas and ideals matter, and they can and they will convert people, but not if you keep them to yourselves. <coughs> not if you keep them to yourselves. So much like the church, big broad spectrum church, we as activists need to do a better job in outreaching to others and being able to share our story. Because Brian has a story of how he came into the movement. Now, Brian, I don't know if you were, you came out of the womb leading the Tea Party, but you know, he, has a, he has a story about what happened to him along the way and why he's here today and why he's part of the fight and each one of you have that story and I bet if I had the time, if we had the time to share those, I bet each one of you has a compelling story about what brought you here tonight. And it was a series of events and why you're afraid that you're losing your country and your state and what you want to do about it in terms of standing up and fighting back. And it takes that, and it's house to house, it's person to person, it's legislative session to legislative session. I mean, the inordinate amount of time that it took to kill PDMP this year, I mean, it took a lot of time and effort and sleepless nights to kill one bad idea that was being advanced by a very good person. And a lot of times, because you really like the person, because you know how good, in this case, she is, you almost second guess yourself. Well, do I really want to do that? You know, I mean, she's a nice gal. I really like her. The issue in my children's freedom is more important. So I have a six year old and a seven year old. Lily Madeline will be eight this year, and Abigail Rose, uh, six, will be seven <coughs> next year. They're 16 months apart almost Irish twins, but not quite. <laughs> and I look at them, and I see their faces every time I'm in Jefferson City, spending a lot of time away from them. I mean, I'm not there tonight with them, because I'm here. And I want to be here. Because I really believe, and I'm not a fearful person, but I really believe that their freedom is threatened like it hasn't been before. And if I want them to grow up in a free Missouri, a free America, and enjoy the same same rights and liberties and freedoms and privileges that I've enjoyed, that my parents enjoy, that my grandparents enjoy, then I'm going to have to fight for that. Because the other side wants to take it. And the other side has taken it, a lot of it. And there is an old axiom that says that power is never given. It is always taken. If you want it, you have to take it back. And you take that back by taking back political power. You do that by elections and then making sure that the people that we put there, and maybe it's you one day that will run, but the people that we put there 